This is Research Like a Pro, episode 287, Flew the Coop, Harriet Huggett Kelsey. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogist professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the authors of Research Like a Pro, a genealogist guide. With Robin Worthland, they also co-authored the companion volume, Research Like a Pro with DNA. Join Diana and Nicole as they discuss how to stay organized, make progress in their research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go! Today's episode is brought to you by findagrave.com, the best place to search online for burial information for your family, friends, and famous people. Hi everyone, and welcome to Research Like a Pro. Hi Nicole, how are you today? Really good. I have been just really enjoying my research and for the holidays. How about you? Same. I have been doing kind of a fun little follow-up project to my study group project on Clumsy Klein. You know, I'm using her for the DNA study group that we're starting soon. And I want to reach out and get a few more test takers to be able to analyze their DNA. And I found especially one who comes from a possible sister. So in thinking about that, I decided to set up a page on Family Lockout where I could explain the project and upload my reports, put a little diagram in there for people to see the family. So that's been really fun working on that. And I want to get that finished up and send message people or email people a link so they can go see that. And then hopefully they'll decide to be part of the project. So that's kind of been a fun follow up to the fall study group. Yeah, what a great beginning for the new year and start really attacking that research question and getting as much DNA evidence as you can. And I love that you're going to be messaging people and sending them to that link that you made so that they can kind of understand the project and really dive deeper and click around and read your report to feel like they understand more about what you're asking when you ask them to share their DNA results. Right. And this has been a brick wall for everyone, clumsy, and different people have assigned different Klein men as her father, but there's no evidence whatsoever out there for it. So I have done two complete projects and I have a good hypothesis now. And I am just hoping DNA will back it up. So it's going to be great. Well, let's do some announcements. We have our Airtable Quick Reference Guide available on PDF on our website. And so if this is the goal that you have maybe for 2024 to learn Airtable, I would invite you to check out the guide and then get started with Airtable. As you know, we love it. And then for our Research Like a Pro webinar series starting in 2024, we have got a wonderful presentation by Amanda Sherwin, and the title is Who is Robert Stewart's Wife Using DNA Clusters in Genealogical Research? This will be held live on Saturday, January 20th at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. And for the description, I will just read what, what Amanda has written for us. Robert Stewart, born 1785 in Virginia, had his first son in 1819 in Missouri. One of his third great-granddaughters searched for 50-plus years for the name of his wife. There were no records of any kind, marriage, land, or wills. DNA shared clusters identified several DNA matches with similar last names that had never been part of the family. By building out the DNA matches and using traditional records, two cousins were able to put the stewards and the new family in the same place when Robert and his wife would have met and married. Further research helped identify which of 10 men was the likely father-in-law. Well, I love this idea of identifying a wife, such a difficult thing, especially when we've got that migration from Virginia to Missouri, where it's hard to decide who is who and records get lost. So I'm excited to learn from Amanda about her case study. Yeah, that sounds like a really great one. It does. Well, we have our Research Like a Pro DNA study group beginning very soon on February 7th, and early bird registration closes January 10th, so that will be just two days after this episode airs, and then final registration ends February 1st. 
So now that the holidays are past and you're thinking about what you want to do for 2024 to become a better researcher, we hope you will join us and start applying DNA to your research. As always, join our newsletter for coupons to find out where we'll be presenting, to find new blog posts, podcasts, and all of the news from Family Locket. And then we hope to perhaps see you live at Roots Tech, which is February 29th to March 2nd. Nicole and I will be there presenting, and we would love to meet any of you who will be there. All right, well, today we are going to talk about one of our ancestors. And this is my second great-grandmother, Nicole's third great-grandmother, Harriet Huggett Kelsey. And this is a fun story to talk about. This was one of the 52 Ancestors series, and the prompt was Flew the Coop. And when I read that, I thought exactly who I wanted to highlight, this grandma, great-grandmother, because she was supposed to inherit a fortune in England, but was disinherited when she joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1841 in England. She was to have been in an arranged marriage and would have set her up for life, but she later married a man of her choice, William Henry Kelsey, which set in motion events that would end up with her moving to the United States and Utah and starting a new life. So it is fun to think about Harriet, and today we're going to talk about some of the early English records for her life, and also some of the histories that tell more of the story. Well, let's start with one of those histories. Harriet's granddaughter, Letty D. Peterson, compiled a history in April of 1929, and writing about her grandmother, she said, Harriet Huggett was one of the triplet girls of Thomas and Jane Comer Huggett, born June 6, 1826, at Lovell Heath, Charwood Parish, England. One of the babies died at birth. The remaining two were called Harriet and Esther. They were so much alike that their mother tied a ribbon on the wrist of the older one, Harriet, to tell them apart. When they were grown, the Mormon elders called them the London Twins. Until they were old ladies, the appearance of these sisters was so identical that it was difficult for a stranger to tell them apart. Before his marriage, even grandfather would become confused in this regard. Harriet always called him Brother Kelsey, and Esther called him Mr. Kelsey, which helped him distinguish them. Isn't that a fun excerpt from that history? I just love that it gives us some of these details that were clearly passed down from Harriet to her children and her grandchildren that they all remembered because they're so fun and just interesting to think about, you know, them being so identical and, and clearly everyone remembered this and the granddaughter was able to write it down. Well, the other fun thing is we have pictures of both of them. So when we look at the pictures and those are in the blog posts that I wrote, you can see that they really were very, very similar looking. And I think identical twins often as they get older, maybe kind of develop their own look, but you know, in the era people pretty much dress the same and wore their hair similar. So it's fun to look at the pictures and imagine these two twins. Right? Yes, it is. And I have uh, some neighbors with twins and I cannot tell them apart identical twins. It can be really challenging when you see a pair of identical twins and they're dressed the same and they look the same to be able to tell them apart. But the people in the family can definitely do it. So I always just think that's so interesting. Well, Harriet's twin sister, Hester, was often called Esther after her immigration to Utah. This was confusing until we found a family group sheet that explained that with an English accent, the name Hester sounded like Esta, and researchers have often confused the records for these sisters, and sometimes people have created separate profiles for Esther and Hester, and that's probably comp- complicated by the fact that there is the story that there were triplets born and that one of the babies died at birth. Right. I go into family search every so often to see what's going on with with Esther and Harriet. And every so often there's a third sister there. We have an Esther and a Hester. So I have to then go and do some merging and fixing it up. So 
you know, we have to be careful when we when we look at the at these ancestors, especially when they're kind of confusing. Right. And is the idea that the triplet that died was a stillborn child or wasn't named? I think so. Yeah, I don't think we really know anything more than the fact that one of the babies died at birth as in the history because at this time, we don't have civil registration yet in 1826. And as far as whether anyone has searched for burials for that child, I don't know. That's a very good thought. Maybe that would be a good piece of research to do. Mm -hmm. Well, a word from our sponsors, Find a Grave is the ultimate online destination to discover burial information and cemetery details for family, friends, and famous people. Finding the graves of your ancestors has never been easier. You can create virtual memorials, add photos of headstones, and honor your loved ones with virtual flowers. Find a Grave's user-friendly search features allow you to explore by name, location, cemetery, date, and more. Their dedicated community of members continually adds new information, so it's worth searching again if you haven't found what you were looking for. Want to be part of the Find a Grave community? Download the free app, visit your local cemetery, and contribute missing grave information. It's a rewarding way to spend time outdoors while helping others find the burial locations of their loved ones. So let's talk a little bit more about Harriet's early life. Although she was born into a modest economic situation, she did have an opportunity to live a very different life. And her granddaughter's history explains that when Harriet and Esther were very small, their father died in 1828 and left their mother with a large family to care for. And as they grew older, the two twins made their home with an older sister, Eliza, and her husband. And Eliza and her husband had only one child, a daughter named Emma. They had been very poor when they married, but they grew to be very wealthy. And the granddaughter says, whatever they undertook in a financial way prospered. They ran a store and owned rows of houses in London. Grandmother was to inherit this fortune equally with their daughter as she was considered the same as their own child, but was disinherited when she joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. While in this home, grandmother had the very best of linens and silver, the most beautiful silks and satins, and in every way she was educated to be a lady. There were servants for all kinds of work, and order prevailed everywhere. At the age of 16, she was to have been married to a wealthy young man. All wedding arrangements were made, but Harriet, not feeling satisfied, broke the engagement. This was a disappointment to her family, as this marriage would have given her money and position. A number of the family had married poor people. So I think this is so interesting, especially thinking about the class system in England, where it was difficult to break out of your class. And so this sister and her husband, it sounds like, had amassed wealth. And here they had an opportunity to have, have Harriet marry into a family that was wealthy and she didn't want to do it. So I've always remembered that story and thought that was just fascinating. Wow. Yeah. I think we're all imagining those books we've read, Pride and Prejudice, all of the Jane Austen type novels, <laughs> the engagements yep. and, and England at that time with you know, the wealthy class being very snobbish toward the poor class and even new money was despised and that kind of thing. So it's interesting to consider that Harriet was living in that time and made the choice to kind of abandon that opportunity to increase her standing in society for something. And let's find out what that was. So what <laughs> what was that something that she wanted to do that was different than marrying a wealthy person. I mean, obviously there's the fact that most people don't want an arranged marriage because they want to choose their spouse. But even beyond that, what caused Harriet to break her engagement? Well, she had been investigating the doctrine of the relatively new religion being preached by the Latter-day Saint missionaries. And although she was ridiculed by her family for this, she decided to be baptized into this new religion in 1841. Her mother, Jane Comer Kelsey, followed suit and was also baptized on June 21st, 1851, by Harriet's husband-to-be, one of the missionaries, Elder William Henry Kelsey. Harriet and William got married on 
September 27, 1852, in the Church of All Saints Parish of Croydon, County of Surrey, in England. William was born and raised in Kent County, England, and he had become a missionary later after joining the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And as a missionary, he traveled the countryside in England and taught the gospel around. So Harriet's granddaughter wrote, as grandfather was a poor traveling elder with no income, grandmother bought the wedding ring and paid for the wedding breakfast. From the time of their marriage, they made their home with her mother. Grandmother kept up the family expenses by renting a small store and managing it on her own. After grandfather had traveled for some time as a missionary and had presided over the Brighton and Croydon branches, he became president of the Kent Conference. After this, he began to draw some salary. Grandmother said that she did not know how she met these family expenses the way she did. The Lord blessed her in every way. She was not only able to keep the family, but she paid for grandfather's expenses as well. Her husband, William Henry Kelsey, was six feet two inches tall, of light complexion, and had a dignified bearing. Harriet was small and could stand under his outstretched arm. She weighed 90 pounds, had a very dark complexion, and her hair was black, shiny, and slightly curly. Well, as you can imagine, it must have been challenging to give up wealth in order to marry somebody who was part of a religion that was ridiculed. And Harriet then had to make some money for her family. She had to, you know, work on that and And I love how this history from her granddaughter talks about how she was meeting the family expenses and renting a small store to manage on her own while her husband was working within the church and not earning the money there. I think she must have had a very strong backbone. She not only left all that, but then she had to keep up the family and you know, even though she was very small of stature, she must have been just a giant in her personality and her strength. Mm-hmm. So fun to, to read that from her granddaughter. Well, let's talk about their immigration to Utah. They had decided to immigrate to Utah Territory to join other church members, and Harriet told her family of their journey across the Atlantic and the plains to Utah. And her granddaughter wrote, she tried to follow the same methods here as in England in bathing her children. She would lie something on the floor for them to stand on as she could not bear the thought of her children standing on the ground. She had to drink out of a tin cup and eat from a tin plate. It was very hard for her to come to this poverty when she'd been used to the best of everything, yet she never complained. She had been in Springville 13 years before she bought her first pair of shoes as she had brought so many pairs with her. She was never able to sell any of her shoes as her feet were so small. She sold or exchanged her beautiful clothes, silk, satins, and lovely linen for food and less expensive clothes to wear. So I've always remembered that story and pictured her perhaps bringing a trunk or something with her with all of these things that she would sell along the way to purchase supplies for the trip and those shoes. She just still had those beautiful shoes. So she probably was someone that everyone in the neighborhood looked up to, or, you know, they would look look at her with her English accent and her refined manners. And it just makes me wonder what people thought of her. And her fancy shoes. (laughs) Right. Well, Harriet and William lived for many years after their immigration to Utah and encountered a lot of difficulties because they weren't just living in the U.S., they were living in Utah Territory, and they were settling a new land. The Utah desert would have seemed much different from the green countryside of their native England, and I can well remember the shock of changing landscapes when we moved, (laughs) and I was a teenager. We moved from Seattle, which was green and rainy, down to Utah, which felt like a desert with brown everywhere. It was just a dry year, but that is quite a different countryside there. So adjusting to that would have been a challenge. Yes. And can you imagine, you know, we've both been to England and you have the countryside with the green fields and and just slow, low hills, you know, nothing like these enormous mountains. She must have gotten up every day and looked at those mountains and just wondered where in the world she was and why she was there. (laughs) It would have been so different. Yeah, that is one 
something that is pretty beautiful about Utah is those tall mountains. Mm -hmm. Well, Harriet died on December 22nd in 1899 and is buried in the historic Springville Cemetery. We have visited the gravesite of Harriet and William many times, and we always think of the life she left behind. In March of 1892, they wrote letters to their children and grandchildren. And these letters were placed in a box in the cornerstone of the old Springville, Utah tithing office. When the letters were opened 50 years later in 1942, they were given to living members of the family. So in Harriet's own words, we can see that despite the challenges of her life, she had no regrets about leaving her prosperous life and marrying a poor missionary settling down in Utah territory in the barren desert. (laughs) So here's the letter that she wrote in 1892. It says, To my dear grandchildren, I was born at Lovell Heath, Charwood Parish, England, on the 6th of June, 1826. I was baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints about 50 years ago by Elisha Davis from Utah. While in Croydon, I fed the elders and sent donations to the Nauvoo Temple. I was married to William Henry Kelsey in 1852, who was then a traveling elder. He was president of the Kent Conference. I came to America in an immigrant ship called the Monarch of the Sea in 1861. I passed through the cricket and grasshopper wars in Springville, Utah. I was a member of the Relief Society in 1868, and in 1877, I was appointed second counselor to Anne D. Bringhurst, who was then president. Since I have been a counselor to Sister Bringhurst, we have made hearts glad, made sad homes happy, cared for the poor and aged, and gave many of our blessings. I hope that all my grandchildren live to see the casket opened and read some of the history that was written 50 years ago. I place my photo in this casket, and although I will not be alive when it is opened, we will meet in heaven. When time will be no more, its joys and sorrows fled, when all its cares are o'er, and numbered with the dead, then eternal life will shine in God's own presence all divine. That is such a sweet letter, and I don't know that I've actually read that before now, so that was kind of touching to think about her actually writing these lines and including those song lyrics at the end, and it really does show that although her life must have been challenging and difficult at times, she was happy to do the things she did and lived a life of service, of helping others and caring for the poor. Right. It's neat to look at our ancestors and see what we can learn from them. And she certainly had the fortitude as a young woman to change the course of her life and gives us an example of courage and perseverance because I wonder how many times she thought, maybe I should just go back. (laughs) When things got hard, did she want to quit? And of course she didn't. She persevered to the end. And I love that letter she wrote as well. I had never seen that until I was looking at the memory section, writing this blog post that I wrote about her and found that. So if you've got something special that's just in your house or in your files, it's so great to get it uploaded to Family Search so that other descendants of that ancestor can enjoy it and learn from it. So I'm very grateful for all those people who have been adding information about Harriet so that we can all benefit from learning. So thanks everyone for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this look into one of our ancestors and maybe given you some ideas about what you can do to write about your own ancestors. Every time I write these blog posts, I learn something new, just like with that letter. It's, it's amazing how putting things together is just a different way to learn and it's a wonderful way to share about our ancestors. So thanks everyone for listening and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your research. If you want to learn more, purchase our books, Research Like a Pro and Research Like a Pro with DNA on amazon.com and other booksellers. You can also register for our online courses or study groups of the same names. Learn more at familylocket.com services. To share your progress and ask questions, join our private Facebook group by sending us your book receipt or joining our courses. To get updates in your email inbox each Monday, subscribe to our newsletter at familylocket.com newsletter. Please subscribe, rate, and review our podcast. We read each review and are so thankful for them. 
We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.